When I was a teenager, we used to ask if, if a tree falls in the forest in the middle of the night, nobody was there. Was there really a sound? Nobody heard it. Okay, that's a nice philosophical question. Today we should ask, if two girls went to the mall, but they didn't upload a photo, did they really go? Okay, I'm not sure they went. I'm not sure. Everything is public. Now, building your family is not a public thing. Building your personality, first of all. Your soul, your neshama. And, and being a, a mother, as well as a grandmother and a great grandmother, it takes time. It takes, it's so different than, than, than the social media. I think that's the main challenge for all of Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And this is the first time that this has ever happened to me. Have you ever interviewed someone thinking that they live in Israel and they're so far from you, but then you realize they live down the block from you? Never happened to me before. It's I, I literally was shocked during the interview. Um, it's not as as simple as it, it's, I just explained it, but it was pretty fine to me to not know that we both uh, lived. I mean, she lived in North America. I live in. You'll hear all about it. This week, I got to sit down with the very talented Sivan Rahav Mayer, who is voted by Globe's newspaper as the most popular female media personality in all of Israel and by the Jerusalem Post as one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world world. She is someone that didn't grow up Orthodox, became Orthodox at a certain point in her life, story there, and she is an incredible journalist, and she is bringing something so different to the Israeli TV, um, just in TV in general. I, I, I say in it that I don't really know any from uh, journalists, and I know there are more. I just don't know anyone, but I do know her, and I've seen so many of her stuff, whether it's the segments she's done or just the Torah Torah con uh, ideas and stuff like that. So strap in for an incredible episode. This episode is in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shleima, Miriam Sara, Bas Yaakov Moshe, as well as Simcha Beryl David ben Avram Moshe. You are going to hear about the Good Faith Effort podcast. I'm pointing as if like it's going to pop up over here. You're also going to hear about the incredible, incredible Simcha time revolution that is happening. And you're going to hear about the Ura auction that the prizes are unbelievable and i want to say the word unbelievable i mean like it doesn't sound believable but they're real and you could win such incredible prizes now here's my conversation with sivan rahav Meyer. i'm yakov langer and you're listening to inspiration for the nation Okay, here I am. I feel like I'm in Israel with uh, Sivan Rahav Mayer. Thank you so much for doing this. You're you're a busy person. You're not an easy person to get a hold of. So thank you for making time for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity and shalom from Yerushalayim. You know, uh, uh, you can definitely feel uh, feel at home. So yeah, Baruch Hashem, thank you. It's amazing. So I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I want to like delve into your background. Um, I saw that you didn't grow up religious. What it's was true. What was your... Yeah, sorry. No, sometimes Americans, they see Israel, you know, it's the holy land. They think we're all holy, you know. So uh, I grew up completely secular here in Israel. It's possible. And I think at the age of 15, I discovered uh, my heritage, my Judaism, my, my identity. That was the, the beginning of everything. Interesting. So so what what spurred that? Was it like one moment or it was like slow over time that like the shift happened? I think it's going to be the most boring Teshuvah story you've ever heard, uh, Yaakov. Okay. But, it's, but it's your story, so that's fair. You know, it's your <laughs> story. Extreme. You know, some, usually people, you know, they tell you, tell you about their tattoos, drugs, alcohol, extreme things, adventures. I grew up here in Israel. Three girls invited me to come for Shabbos. They said in Hebrew two words, Boy in the Shabbat, come for Shabbos. And here I am. I mean, I'm here just because someone cared about me and invited me to come to their Shabbat meal, to their to see what Shabbat is all about, he experienced this magic, and here I am. So in a way, it means it's a boring story. No lights, no thunders, no. But in a way, this boring story means so much, you know, for us. Uh, next Shabbos, will we invite someone in a few days to, to our uh, uh, Seudah, to our Shabbat meal? Uh, because it, uh, you know, it, it affects people. It can change their life. I fell in love with Shabbat at the age of 15, and uh, it changed basically everything. So, um I, I keep, you know, sometimes today I'm, I'm on TV and I'm a reporter, a journalist, but I always, you know, I'm, I, I always try to invite people to see if someone, only if they're interested. But uh, I was interested and uh, basically I, I can never thank them enough. Those three teenagers from, from Israel that, you know, they, they cared about. I really love that story because I think a lot of times when it comes to like doing acts of kindness, we're always so 
we're always like thinking of like chopping the wood in the forest for the old lady who will die unless she has firewood. And <laughs> we don't really get those opportunities so often, but we always have that opportunity to, you know, you know, uh, help someone onto a bus or invite someone for a Shabbos meal. Like those opportunities, like it, you're right, it is a little more boring, but there's something so beautiful about it because it happens so, the opportunity is so much out there. You know? Exactly. I love those stories. Uh, once again, I'm a journalist. We usually look for, you know, um, things that are, you know, uh, can um, create rating and engagement and make people, you know, uh, be really something tremendous. But the daily chesed, the, the routine, you know, the, the things that are that just as it, like you said, uh, you don't have to do something uh, extraordinary. Sometimes it's, it's, it's right here, right now. Look around you, find the right opportunity and you can definitely change someone's life in, the, in, in, a, in a minute, even, even in a second. And uh, we have once again, I asked those three girls, we were 15, just 15, you know, teenagers. So years afterwards, when I was already like religious through, uh, I started keeping Shabbat. So I asked them why. I mean, why did you invite me? Uh, and they said, um, we saw like uh, in a way it, it belongs to you in, in their perspective. Uh, it belongs to you too. It's our mutual treasure. We, we don't want to change you because if you uh, ask someone to come to a Shabbat, this, for Shabbat, you don't change them. It, it's the, it belongs to them. I mean, Shabbat wasn't their Shabbat. It was also, also mine. So understanding the concept of this mutual gift in a way, we, they just said, you know, we thought Shabbat, it, it's also yours. It's like, you know, you lost something you, and, and we, we, we bring it back to you. That, that's all. It was so simple, you know, uh, that perspective, you know, you don't have to, to uh, prove, you know, prove that Mount Sinai and, and uh, uh, creation of the world and scientists and all those experts and discussing all, all, the, all the conflicts, you know, the, the Holocaust. No, just, you know, Shabbat, that, that's it. It's, sometimes it's really simple. That's really, really nice. So often when like, you know, from the people that I've spoken to on their, I guess, Balchuva journey, there, there sometimes is some pushback from other family members because by someone saying, hey, I now want to become Orthodox, that sometimes not, usually people are in no way trying to like, cast any negative feelings towards their parents or their siblings, but sometimes they kind of feel that. Did you get any form of pushback from your family? Uh, the truth is my parents are great, best, and we're, we're friends. So turns out if you just discuss things, you know, in a transparent, open way, in Hebrew, we call it dugly, you know, in a straightforward. And we're Israelis, you know, we're not shy. So I told them what I wanted. And they said, okay, we think this is uh, too much. And we, we found the right, you know, we've, we've the right balance until I got mm -hmm. married. And now, you know, it's, it's, it's my house today. I can do whatever I want. Uh, so in a way, the par my parents weren't the problem. The real problem, I think, the colleagues from, from on TV. I worked mm. uh, for Israeli TV since I was six. <laughs> so uh, so people know me. I'm, I'm on TV 24-7. And now the famous girl on TV, this teenager, she's on TV every day. Now she wants to work like just 24 six. What's going on? Is she crazy? Hmm. Is she lazy? That was much harder. And you know, the gossip on the news on the was it was printed, it was it was published. So that was doing something in a very public way. You know, the people in Israel uh, uh, saw me changing in front of the, their eyes. That was harder. You know, my family was Baruch Hashem great. Uh, uh, discussing it with, with the public and the, the journalists, that was uh, more complicated. You're, I mean, I, I don't even know how many there are, but like, you're the only person I could think of that is a from TV reporter. Uh, is that, is that something when you were becoming from that you're like, oh, maybe this path wouldn't be the right direction only because you don't see other from TV reporters or was that the opposite of like, no, hey, who else has this opportunity like me? So first of all, there are more uh, from TV anchors. Uh, different, by the way, we do not all, all think the same. We're Baruch Hashem diverse, you know. The fact you, you keep Shabbat, it doesn't mean you, you think uh, that we don't think, you know, the same on many of you know, the issues in Israel now. But still, I think journalists are less, in a way, less important today. Real media, it's, it's, it's here, okay? That's the real TV, radio. The, I work on Israeli TV and, and on Israeli radio and in, in the biggest ma daily magazine in Israel. But still, I wanna, in a way, I think I work for free for Mark Zuckerberg. For sure, he's my real boss, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> no payments, but that's the, and we all work for him. In a way, we're all jewelers today. It, it's not so rare because uh, uh, each person that is listening to us now, you're, uh, I want to tell you, you are also a journalist. You create content, you upload, you, you post, you share, you take a picture, 
you design things. I mean, you record things everywhere. Uh, so um, even, in, you know, you're the family WhatsApp group. That's the source of information today. For most Israelis, that's where they get the information from. They're not on TV anymore. Okay, the, their mother tells them what's going on, not the correspondent, the, the commentator on, <laughs> on, on TV. Everything changes. So in a way, yeah, you asked me about through people on TV. Yeah, there are a bit, but it's it's not the scene anymore. But I still work there. People are still watching. But let's look like, you know, we're Jews. We should look about the, the future in 10 years, in 20 years. What does it mean? You know, reporter, TV. Well, all reporters, we all have a TV stations going with us anywhere. Things are really changing rapidly. I, I always, you know, think about that. You know, I look at the the, the the new circumstances and try to, to be relevant. But yeah, things are really changing. And in the States, it's, it's uh, you know, it's everywhere, not just here. Is that is that more scary for you or is that more exciting for you that things are changing? Which which feeling more? Um, In a way, you know, I, 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 I do like this because the Knesset, our parliament, it's here. The entrance to Yishalayim. I'm here. I live in Nakhlaot, the neighborhood of Nakhlaot, uh, near Rehavia Shari Chesed, the American colonies with many, many Americans, uh, American uh, neighbors, but the, the Knesset is, is right here. And I was, I covered the parliament for years and I saw how, in a way, I become un- not so relevant because they, the politicians, they were always after me. Okay. They asked me to interview them. Now they're after you directly. I remember the day I came, I came to the, you know, the Knesset, the, the offices, the, the, the many floors and, and rooms and, you know, secretaries and, and members of the Knesset. And I felt, I remember the second I saw, they're not after me anymore. They don't want me. They don't need this mic. They have, they have their own mic. And I saw the way they reach out to people. I don't care if it's, I know it's, it can be Trump or Biden or Netanyahu or, I don't care. It's not about the, the certain, pol- the specific politician. The system, yeah, for sure, it changed. Now, is it scary? We're Jews, we're flexible. You, we know how to deal with changes uh, for thousands of years, harder changes. It made me, by the way, uh, a different you know, as a journalist I stopped covering like current events because you have the data you have the information you don't need me anymore to stand there good evening what happened today in the Knesset you know it you have the information hmm. the minute it happens you get a push notification so why do you need me for and it made me a better journalist because I realized now I have to seek for I would I would say deeper content what, what, what I mean why am I important why do you want to listen to me maybe because I give you the broader context the bigger picture and I started you know, dealing with the parasha, the weekly portion, with the Torah, with our heritage, it it changed. You know, the focus, that the what I, the perspective, the fact journalism changes. I can use social media, you know, to discuss. Now I have a weekly shiur on TV, also on Facebook, etc. On on the parasha. That's you know, that's something new. Thanks to the fact I'm I'm not this running reporter anymore. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool and very innovative. Very innovative. You know, you know, I always heard that, like, you know, like the Sia Mashas, that the fact that Hashem made these giant stadiums for them to play football, that wasn't the real reason. The real reason is he, we needed a space for a giant Sia Mashas. So, like, maybe the whole idea of, like, <laughs> news and TV was for your, like, Parsha every single week. So, you wow, never, wow, you never wow. know. I love, it. I love it. By the way, one of the most exciting, really, events of my life, MedLife Stadium, Wow, I'll never forget it. Just before COVID, I was there covering the event. It was like, really, my, my husband learns the daily daf, so I'm, we're really connected. And, oh, Hashem. Yeah, wow. You mentioned That's really that. incredible. Wow, the biggest thing, I covered it for Israeli TV, and people here said, wow, I mean, uh, 100,000 people in what in, in America? I mean, what, what? what? What is it? That was like, yeah, uh, a nice, nice thing to, to cover. Do you think that like a lot of people in Israel, like they hear about America and they're like, wait a second, there's Torah going on in America? Like that is existing? They're like, well, no, we're not Amaratzim. Like there's a lot of good tzaddikim yeah. here. For sure, I think we're focused. The Israelis, the Tzabras, I was, I was there once. I was really focused on what's going on here and I couldn't care less. Sorry, I don't want to insult anyone. It, it was like Americans, they can definitely make Aliyah. Or they can donate their money. That's it. The only two <laughs> I couldn't care less when it comes to your communities. You know, the minute I started Boch Hashem, now I'm over the, almost every month. I have this as a scholar in residence, journeys abroad in Europe, and especially in the States. I just came back for a week in, in the States, Jersey, Five Towns, New York, uh, University, uh, Boch Hashem. So uh, Young Israel of, of Woodmere, that, uh, they invited me, but we had a whole week in Queens, Bronx. So now I know about our sisters and brothers. There are millions of them. But I was never, as an Israeli journalist for years, I thought, you know, I cover the main thing in the Jewish nation and you are something so, you know, you're not relevant. You can come here, 
Send money, that's it. The minute you discover, I mean, the things you built there, I'm really impressed, you know, the communities and the, I would say, educational system um, and the yeshivot for sure and the world of, of Torah and chesed, it's impressive. And sometimes there are Israelis even come closer to Torah when they see the things you built there because it's cool. It's from America. It's not from Israel. It's not a local hmm. Torah. Not, not boring, you know, not a native Israeli. Wow, America? From Americans? That's cool. Some days they're very successful. They're this special type of Americans, what I, I might call, you know, someone who can be a real Haredi and a real doctor or a real lawyer and successful and really like in a way um, balanced and really like into it when it comes to Torah and into it when it comes to being successful in the outside world. And it's, I think it's a t- special type of Kiddush Hashem, what we in Israel here can, can really appreciate and even try to, maybe it can even inspire us to be, you know, to uh, strengthen our Jewish identity. I think you have, yeah, you can definitely be sometimes even role models. We can learn from you. And as an Israeli in the past, you know, I didn't think I have anything to learn from the uh, Jews around the world. Yeah, we can definitely learn many things from you. By the way, living as a minority and being, you know, thrilled about, let's take Hanukkah as, as an example. You stand there with your little menorah and it's Christmas everywhere. How do you do it? I mean, why is it attractive? Why don't you see Santa as something more attractive? Here in Israel, it's Hanukkah everywhere. Okay, it's a Jewish state. Well, Hashem, this is the, the pulse. This is the, the atmosphere, envi- the, the environment. It's, it's Hanukkah everywhere. But it's not, you have to create your own Hanukkah, your, your, your own uh, um, identity. So yeah, it's, it's really impressive. We, we have a lot to learn. To learn. You're, you're definitely making me miss Israel because it, like exactly what you're saying, like every every yunta feels so much more zoomed in over there because everyone around you, it's in the ear, you know, what, no, it doesn't make a difference like who whose observant level is what because, okay, this is the this is yuntif now, it's yuntif. So, okay, you maybe celebrate it a little differently, but that's what it is. It's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, the, after 2000 years, you know, when we came back here, everything, you can describe so many great things about, you know, having a Jewish state, Baruch Hashem, after, in our, in our homeland. But sometimes you need that perspective of the outside visitors. And my American friends, when they come to Israel, and they're thrilled, you know, the bus, it says Chag Sameach. Before Pesach, it's, it's relevant, it's us, it's home. And uh, they go to the grocery store, I don't know, they shop, they buy things in Hebrew. And that is exactly the language Abraham Avinu spoke here. I do, I do like this because Harabite, okay, it's there. And that's where Abraham, <laughs> okay, that you have the Knesset, Harabite, it's a whole tour here in Yerushalayim. But basically, yeah, this is where all the prophets, the, the prophecies, it happens here. So in a way, sometimes we need you as visitors, you know, I always say that, you know, there's the birthright project, the Taglit birthright. Uh, they bring uh, students, you know, from co- unaffiliated Jews from colleges, they, they take them to Israel. I think sometimes Israelis, they should also go on a birthright trip to be excited. Sometimes you take things for, for granted. You're not excited enough about, about living here. So uh, you, you, sometimes I see you come to the Kotel. Not you personally. People, you know, the American style t- tourists, when they come to the Western Wall, it's like, wow, it's like, I live here. It's like Mamila. It's uh, right next to the yeah. Zaha. You know, it's, it's here. So yeah, we need your perspective in, in, so, in many ways. Yeah. And I don't think you guys are doing anything wrong because, like, I, that same idea again. There's no, there's no something, anything special. Let's say about the Statue of Liberty. But like, I'm from New York. I grew up in New York. I've been here my whole life. I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. Why? Because like, okay, whatever. Like, I've seen it from a distance. I don't really care so much because I could always go there. And I think that's just natural for like, whenever you are in a certain place, you take for granted the obviously landmarks, but even, you know, the, the hush of places. I'm sure there's a lot of yeshivas and, and wonderful shuls and rabbanim in America that I don't really go to because I'm like, oh, I'll go to Rabbi Waxman in, in a nut next year or whatever. It's not such a big deal. So I kind yeah, of hear for that. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, when, when I, don't, I just had the privilege of interviewing Rabbi Herschel Schechter, yeshiva of YU. That was really an incredible experience. I interviewed him on, on Shabbos with a Beautiful event in five towns. I met Rabbi Kaminetsky from, from Philadelphia. Whenever I'm in the state, JFK, you know, the first, I don't, my husband laughs at me. He tells me, you don't land in JFK. You land at the all hell. I mean, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is all hell by by next 10 minutes from JFK. Yeah, whenever I'm in the states, I want to, you know, catch and see and I don't want to miss anything. And you're, you're just there, you know. Uh, so yeah, in a way, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's for us, it's, uh, it's rare, you know, when you, when you're, when you're a visitor. And definitely, the, the, there's a lot, a lot to see. I mean, from the more Haredi places, you know, New Square. I sat with the Square Rebbe, New Square, the the Admor, the leader of the Square uh, uh, Hasidic community, Lagod for sure, Mansi for sure. 
but also the the unaffiliated too. I find that I find it uh, more important whenever I come to strong communities. I ask them about you know the where are the Jews? Uh, you know I want to meet the, uh, the the ones those who didn't did not invite me. Those who asked me to come, they are they are okay. They they'll be fine. Now take me to the Jews. They don't they don't send the kids. They don't get the Jewish education. They don't go go to shuls. I always look for the, the unaffiliated Jews. By the way, many times they're Israelis. I mean, former Israelis they come to the states, and sometimes they're not so so connected. Uh, we have many of those uh, there. We'll be right back to this week's podcast, but I want to tell you about two things. I first want to tell you about Simcha Time, and then I'm going to tell you about my new favorite podcast, Simcha Time. <sighs> Stay tuned for this episode because it is one of the most beautiful answers that I've ever heard about a chesed that someone went out of their way to do for someone else. So Simcha Beryl David Ben Avram Moshe was someone, Allah who, Shalom, who went out of his way no matter what to do chesed for others. So we are remembering him. And more than that, we are taking on the things that he did to go out of our ways to do chesed for someone else. So this is the idea of Simcha time. This week, you've heard me saying this, and I'm doing it. It's changing my life. I guarantee it will change your life. Go ahead and do something that's out of the way for yourself to help another human being. It is it is juice for the soul. You will feel so good helping someone else out. This ad isn't telling you to go and buy that new technology over there that costs a thousand dollars. This ad is telling you to go ahead and f- do something that's going to make you feel the most fulfilled person in the entire world. So. More than that, you're going to go ahead and you're going to talk about, you're going to brag about, we want you to be braggadocious about the Simcha time, the chesed that you did by your Shabbos table. You all go around and you discuss what you did that chesed. It is changing thousands of Shabbos tables and we want you to get in on this. Again, you don't have to do anything besides going out of your way to help another person. They'll smile, you'll smile, and Hashem will smile. So go ahead and do the Simcha time. Now, let me tell you about another incredible, wonderful podcast. If you're watching this or listening to this, that means you have good taste for podcasts, if I may say so myself. And another amazing podcast, am I allowed to say that? I mean, I could say that, right? Another amazing podcast is the Good Faith Effort Podcast. So every podcast, you judge a book by its cover. You judge a podcast by its host. Hopefully you guys like me and, and hopefully, more importantly, you like my guests. So you have Rabbi Dr. Ari Lam here, who is an incredible host. He's fun. He's smart. He's intelligent. He's heartwarming. He's all those mixed into one. Go ahead and follow him on Twitter if you're not. And he runs a really good show. He brings on really dynamic, unique guests. And each week he covers different things that I don't think any other podcast is doing. Like sometimes you could have a podcast and you're like, oh, that's like Joe Rogan. He does his own thing. It's his own realm of podcasting. And Here's a little explanation of what it is. The Hebrew Bible is every bit America's moral founding document as the Constitution is our political founding document. Every week, Rabbi Dr. Ari Lam speaks with thinkers, writers, artists, and faith leaders to explore how the Bible continues to inform our lives today, from politics to psychology to pop culture, bringing Americans of different traditions and persuasions closer together as so much else threatens to pull us apart. So, he has... 100 episodes out there. And I'm going to list the past five episodes so you could get a range, an understanding of the range of the topics that he discusses and the people he has. Rabbi Yitzchak Etshalom, Developments in Bible Study. Hollis Robbins, Are the Humanities Flourishing? Rick Richmond, Hollywood and the Land, People and State of Israel. David French, American Renewal. Yechiel Leiter, John Locke and the Bible. Armin Rosen, Journalism with a worldview. Jeremy Brown, Plagues and Pandemics from Bible to Today. This podcast is is so fantastic. And as a podcaster, I get nachas hearing other podcasts that I have nothing to do with, aside from the fact of that I am a listener and I enjoy it. And I don't plug podcasts unless I like it myself. So I mean, there's been one or two podcasts to reach out to do an ad, but how can I sell it? you on a podcast that I don't like. I like this podcast. It's great. It's it's different. I, I love how each episode is so different. Like I will find an episode. I'm like, I love this episode. And another episode, I'm like, that episode wasn't for me, but maybe it's for you. And the next one is for me. There's so many different wide ranging guests that he has. So go ahead and check out the Good Faith Effort Podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. And now back to this week's episode. 
Okay, so you said a lot of things that I want to ask you on, uh, and there's only so much time. But so you you've interviewed and and spoken to the best of the best. I mean, it, it's so many people, and I know it's such a hard question to answer. But like, has there been an interview, whether a politician, whether a, a rebbe, whether a Talmud Chacham, or or someone who has an amazing story that really moved you or changed you? Wow, many. Wow, I interviewed uh, Rabbi Vadi Yusef, a blessed memory. Yeah, I the, yeah, that was really uh, an experience. I interviewed um, all the politicians. I mean, you know, uh, in Israel, you can definitely describe. I would say the last decade, uh, you can give it the headline uh, to BB or not to BB. That's the way to define. <laughs> so I interviewed BB and not BB. You know, and Sarah Netanyahu, uh, Prime Minister's wife, and uh, uh, all the politicians, uh, victims of terror. I find it sometimes. You know, they speak about essential emotional, eternal things. Sometimes when you touch, unfortunately, death, it reminds you of, you know, what's really important in life. So yeah, sometimes victims of terror or, or any... During COVID, by the way, I think meaningful things were said. Uh, we promised ourselves so many things during COVID, you know, that was meaningful. Interviewing people, you know, locked during lockdowns and the, the pandemic, you remember the days. I think it was, it was meaningful being with people. I was understood they were all, you know, with their kids and I was... You know, in the studio, trying to connect and make them, you know, do something uplifting. Everything I, I, I believe, war in Ukraine, I, I many hours, day and night. Yeah, thank you, Putin. Day and night in the studio, interviewing people from Ukraine, the Jewish community, especially in Ukraine, real heroes. You know, that self devotion in our generation. I interviewed many times, Olim Chadashim, new immigrants, Nefesh Benefesh from the States, but also from, from other places. So, yeah, I try to, you know, it's all the survivors. I try to touch. You know, things that are, the problems with the news, they're new. I mean, they're always new. And the next day, they're old. And the next day, they're even older. I try, to, I try to create news that will always be relevant. Even in five years, you know, it's not the daily headlines about uh, the pol politics. It's more about, you know, things that will, in five years, if you'll see this report, I hope it will still be meaningful in a way. So these, you understand, that's the, that's the content. Uh, and uh, I, ever, ever, I, no, I evergreen content. I hope the most interesting interview is still ahead, you know. I hope uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's gonna happen tomorrow, you know. What's it like uh, interviewing Riv uh, Vadi Yosef or 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 like Lord Jonathan Sachs? Like these are people larger than life. It's like w what's that like, and and like what's what's your objective when you're interviewing them? I always try to do. Uh, uh, you're familiar with the world with the word tachlis. You know, it's Yiddish, right? It's not yeah, Yiddish. yeah, yeah. Practical. I always try to be practical when I meet someone. That is like a giant, you know, uh, Rabbi Yosef, or yeah, Rabbi, I had the really, I was privileged to work with Rabbi Sachs, a few projects. We had a beautiful project together, the, the Israeli singer Ishai Ribo, uh, with Rabbi Sachs, and I'm there in the middle, you know, translating Hebrew, English. I saw, I watched that, I watched that. Yeah, thousands, and that's a beautiful, that was a really beautiful project uh, during COVID. So I always try to be tachlis. It means, give me something that I can take home with me, something uh, accessible, available, applicable, something I can take into my life immediately. I always ask robot, the biggest robot, or even if I interview like a famous professor who have Nobel Prize winners here, here in Israel, Bo Hashem, or I always try to, to take something, by the way, I didn't mention, I, I love covering peace agreements. We had four, four Abraham Accords in the last uh, three years, and we hope we'll have more, and we'll sign more peace agreements. That's always, always a, 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 a truth, I'm, I always be privileged. But when I interview and I, I give it as, you know, I, it can be a tip for, for us. Try to take something into your life because uh, the Lubavitch Rebbe always said, ha -se hua ikar. Ha, the, 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 the deed is the most important thing. It's not the philosophical, you know, the perspectives and the um, uh, comments they will share. So I always ask Rabbi Sachs, what can I do? What can, how can I be better? How can I improve myself? Being a better mother, a better wife, a better career woman, a better daughter, you know. So I always, that's that's my tip. When you meet someone huge and you know you're tiny, you're not a giant, that's me. Take, try to take something with you uh, for tomorrow. And, you know, and always give it to the, the people that are sharing it with others. So yeah, I, I have really so many th things I wrote or, or recorded out of, you know, the, the trying to make those experiences into something uh, tachlis. Yeah, that, that's the goal. That's really beautiful. So I, I want to talk a little about your family life and, and obviously your husband, who, who, correct me if I'm wrong, he's also a reporter. 
Yeah, my husband in India is also a journalist, hosting shows. He has a radio show, many, many things uh, here in, in, in Israel. Uh, Baruch Hashem, by the way, he grew up completely from his father is a rabbi, my father-in-law, 11 brothers and sisters. Uh, wow. So we yeah, have different background. And we both well, we have a show together on, in, on Israeli radio once a week. It's great for Shalom Bayit. You never fight because you have you can fight, but you get, you must uh, <laughs> have, you must have Shalom Bayit until the show starts. So uh, Baruch Hashem, it's a beautiful uh, yeah uh, tip for uh, for couples have have a show together on, on the radio. That's good Shalom Bayit <laughs> hack. Um, is there ever any I guess challenge for you that the fact that like you're such a public person and people probably feel that they know you to some extent. Like I know with my podcast, again, not the same levels of, of the amount of people that you're reaching, but even so, like I, I could understand a little, like so many people come over to me as if like they know me and I'm like, you don't know me. You just know my persona that I put out there a few times a week. Like you don't know all of me. Like do you ever feel that challenge? For sure. I think Hashem really blessed me. The fact I started working on Israeli media when I was six, it made me in a way normal, you know, keeping like sanity because otherwise, if you become a celebrity, you know, one day, whoa, that's really, uh, I think usually it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge you have to face and sometimes it's a real disaster. I mean, I see people, I know people, they were completely anonymous and one day, you know, a reality show, a successful song, something happened, you know, uh, someday they just cook on Israeli TV. We like, we love those uh, kitchen uh, uh, um, you know, episode series on the day people cook reality shows here a lot. And boom, you become the best, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know, a uh, uh, baker uh, in the country. And you're everyone from, from no one knows you, now everyone. And it changes, it, it's, it's a huge, I mean, how do you keep, you know, staying on the ground and being balanced and focused? And what happens in, in two months? There's a new celebrity, bye-bye. We all forget about you. Now you have to, you know, landing is also really hard. So I think in a way, Boch Hashem, I was blessed. And it's it, on social media, it's crazy. I mean, the, the, you create stars and they, they disappear and it's really dangerous. As I said, I think I was blessed since I was six. I'm 41 today. So for 35 years, wow, people, they recognize me. Once they wanted a signature, now, then they wanted a nice selfie. Today, by the, one, by the way, they want a selfie where they look like a monkey. It's like... Uh, you know, the, the way people, teenagers, the way they do the, uh, 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 with their talent. So <laughs> no problem. Now they take self in five years. I don't know what, they'll, what, they, what, what will they do with Zlat Hashem. I'm here. It's very, I would say, well, I, as I said, I feel it's, it's stable. It's, yeah, I'm famous. My kids, when they are with me on the street, sometimes it bothers them. But I like being in, by the way, it's a, I, th I feel it's like a shliach I be, In a way, I, it belongs to the public. I'm there in a way, it's their voice on TV. So I like it when they come, you know, I like those, the way they respond and, and, and tell me uh, and share stories. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I I love it. I mean, um, sometimes in Manhattan, we, we, people do not recognize me. I was in Rome now. I had lectures in Rome. What's going on here? Nobody in Rome wants, no, no selfies in Rome. So uh, I'm, I'm used to it. That's really beautiful. H how do you balance being a mother and also so having such a successful career and being so busy all the time. Who said I know how to balance? You asked me, how do you balance? <laughs> yeah, well, you're doing it. You seem to be doing a good job let, at it. Let's rephrase. Let's say, how, how do you try? How do you try to balance? How do you, um, okay, how do you try to balance? I think in a way, it's our mutual challenge. All of us, all of us. Uh, external things and in general things. You can be a single, you know, uh, uh, um, someone, uh, on, uh, you can be a soldier, you can be a yeshiva, yeshiva student. I would think the internal, external, I would say conflict, that's the main conflict we'll face. Do we do things? Uh, at, the, the, at the end of the day, they, it takes like a process, it takes time. And we do not get immediate certification, immediate reward. In a way, it does not mean no likes and no, you know, uh, shares. And, and that, that it, it means, think about five months, uh, nine months of, of, of of being pregnant or uh, teaching your, your kid to, to walk or to, to talk. It's a process, okay? And here on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, I don't care, it's, it's, it's so fast. I think that's the main conflict we're all facing and we need us all to breathe. First of all, we have to acknowledge, to understand, this is the mission. It's our spiritual mission today as Jews, especially as Jews. This is, that's the story, 
Okay? People tell me, no, Zionism is a story. No, Torah and science, forget it. It belongs to the previous, previous generations. The day, this is the story. Can you create uh, uh, your soul? Can you be connected to Torah, to Fila, kids, chinur, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, building your family, everything that is private and intimate and in a world where everything is public. When I was a teenager, we used to ask if, if a tree falls in the forest in the middle of the night, nobody was there. Was there really a sound? Nobody heard it. Okay, that's a nice philosophical question. Today we should ask, if two girls went to the mall, but they didn't upload a photo, did they really go? Okay, I'm not sure they went. I'm not sure. Everything is public. Now, building your family is not a public thing. Building your personality, first of all. Your soul, your neshama. And, and being a, a mother, as a grandmother, and a great-grandmother, it takes time. It takes, it's so different than, than, than the social media. I think that's the main challenge for all of us. It's, it's not just me. So let's let's discuss. Let's work together. But it's, it's that you you identified the main the main uh, task. I think that's really well said and and really beautiful. That's yeah. I, I it's definitely the challenge. A friend of mine said, and I've said this before, but it, it calls for saying again that we're living in the busiest time that has ever existed. Think of the entire history. No one was busier than us. Like just even the use of like, just the, the fact that, you know, even past 100 years, the fact that we have lights now used to be it's nighttime, it's dark, maybe you have a lamp, but work is done. Now you could work 24 seven, you could connect with any part of the world. You know, like you're, you're probably going to bed soon for me. I'm just starting work now and we could interact. It's, it's, and because of we're all so connected and there's a beautiful aspect to it, there's still that, that downside that we we have no time to be ourselves or for our family and it is a real real challenge exactly exactly imagine i mean it was supposed to be so easy i mean everything there's so many machines they can help us out so why i am why are we so busy and not if it was supposed to be so easy like so excuse me it sounds like a song but seriously i mean it's it's i mean we should take advantage of all the, those tools technical tools and be much you know learn more torah be with our kids and the opposite happened. I mean, in a way, we're much, much busier. And those tools, they, they control us. I do not control. I'm not sure. I control. I don't use the phone in a way it uses me. So how come? I mean, um, that's, that's the main challenge, but don't be depressed. I mean, we've been through harder challenges. Bo Hashem, we found in the state of Israel and wars and terror attacks and anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and persecutions. In, in a way, Hashem gives us, I think, more delicate ch challenges to date and more. I would say that it's, 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 it's harder to, even, it's the society of wealth, by the way. Sometimes being rich is harder than being poor. Sometimes being, I think, I think it's way, again, I don't, I don't want either. Uh, <laughs> I don't, not want either. I don't want e the chesarin of either, but I, per, and I, maybe I'll get backlash. I think it's harder to be, uh, the, there's more challenges with being a rich person than being a poor person. Yes, being poor is 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 brutal and difficult, and if someone's like starving, like for sure. But like, I think we all write off the challenge of being rich because it's like, oh, you have so much money, everything's it's fine, everything's everything's fine. Every, but like the chat, there's so many challenges there. For sure, for sure. First of all, I bless you. Uh, you you'll be rich. You know, successful podcasts. Podcast all over the days with Zat Hashem, you'll have the oh, challenge of you know of being rich. But uh, yeah, you, you're right because I interviewed Nathan Sharansky. Nathan Sharansky was a prisoner in a mos in, in communist Moscow, you know, behind the Iron Curtain during the years of of communism. And he was there in jail, and he told me he's a real hero here in Israel. Had more than ten years in a small cell because of his beliefs. You know, he wanted to make Aliyah, he wanted to to, to be a proud Jew, and they, they arrested him. And he told me. It's much harder outside. You know, when he was like released from jail, he said it, it became harder because the world is confusing. Inside, it was crystal clear, right from wrong, blue, uh, black and white, you know, true, false. Outside, where the, where the evidence is open, it's much, it's much more challenging. And in a way, it's true. I mean, it's hard for us uh, today. I, I was in a very, I would say, fancy, I, I won't mention the name, but, you know, uh, one of the best Jewish schools, private for sure, private schools in America, this, this system, by the way, with tuition, I, I see it as something, I don't want to say not Jewish, but yeah, it's it's not moral. You know, the fact you have to be rich in order to get Jewish education, it's a problem. It's something, it's it's really, that's the millions of our brothers and sisters cannot afford. It's like, it's, it's so in Israel, it's it's free. 
So in a way, I, I, I spent like a few hours in a fantastic shul in LA, in LA. And the principal, the, the head of the school, she told me that the parents pay, you know, 40, 50,000, like crazy. But you cannot buy, she said, the spark. You cannot buy the spark in the kid's eyes. It's, it, it, it's something, you know, you, can, you must create. Intuition cannot create it. And she said, sometimes when they finish, when they graduate and they come to one year, one year, gap year in Israel, you find the spark. Suddenly, they, they're shining. So in a way, yeah, money is not enough. We have to, to create. And sometimes money even, you know, um, it's an obstacle when you have to create the, the spark and you want, you want people to feel enthusiasm about their, their really strikes. Wow. Well said. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, I need to tell you about URA. Yes, you know who URA is. You know what they're about. But they blow my mind by how many things they're doing for people. And by the way, I don't know if I've ever done an auction like this because they're, they're doing an auction. But like the prizes that they have, oh my gosh. Uh, we'll get to the prizes, but first I want to tell you about Ura. Ura obviously is, is a, they do care of world, worldwide. They do so much. They have, you know, they send thousands of people that would not be going to yeshivas. They'd be going to public schools. They send them to the yeshivas. They are saving so many souls. If they were just doing that, I'd be like, wow, that's incredible. But they're doing a lot more. They have over 11,000 Torah mates every week. That's people learning together. Chavrusa uh, Shaft people who who and this anyone if you want to be a part of it you could be uh, you know someone who 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 knows a little and someone who knows a little more just learning torah and studying and, and getting to know more about judaism um they have they send college age kids to israel which is so important and you go on campuses these days and and there's so much distortion and just lies going around they get to show that hey you want to judge israel go to israel see what your heritage is about it's really beautiful when i was in israel i saw so many people uh that ura sent there um they do shaduchim for for bali chuvas shaduchim alone is difficult but imagine your entire family is not religious or even your entire family is they're also balchuvas but you maybe didn't integrate into the community as well and you need help and guidance that's what ura is there for they have the famous the zone camp i had so many of my friends that go there that change the lives of both the counselors the campers and the counselors and the staff everyone who goes there they have the chill zone which is a weekly learning group and so much more. Um, I love, I personally love Ura. I love what they're doing. I love their their character, Five-ish. There's one question I have on it. I mean, maybe this is on purpose. Five-ish has four fingers. Is that on purpose? Because he's like Five-ish, he's a $5 bill. I don't know. But you know what? I don't think we have enough mascots in Claudius So I'm very happy with Ura and their Five-ish mascot. It, it, that alone, I am so thrilled with them. But honestly, the work that they're doing, they're, they're bringing Mashiach and you could go ahead and support them. So they have, prizes that are over $650,000 in value. Um, it's $5 a ticket, every single ticket, $5, which is crazy. I mean, I've been doing auctions where I give $100 and $500 and, and, and that makes sense. But when I could get an incredible prize for $5, that's when I know uh, it's, it's incredible. But more than that, just the five dollars. If you're listening to this, and it's before May 16th, you can get the last chance deal where you will submit and you'll get tickets. You're gonna get free six free chance, free chances to win tickets to Israel. So um, go ahead and do this before May 16th. But honestly, if it's after May 16th, you could also join whenever you're watching this. Um, also, tune into the Urathon on Masi Shabbos, May 20th. So, May 20th, put it in your calendars. I need to watch the Urathon, and then you watch Inspiration for the Nation. Go ahead and watch them first. They're going to be live. Um, you could buy tickets at uraauction.org, or you could call 1 877 7 auction. That's 1 877 7 auction. You will hear, you will see links in the show notes to just purchase your tickets. But let me go through the prizes. This is what I wanted to get to. Okay. Um, you can win $18,000 cash. Think of think of money. Think of five dollars. Now think of twenty dollars. Now think of a thousand dollars. Now think of five thousand. Now think of ten. Now think of eighteen thousand dollars. Crazy. You could get six tickets to Israel. Um, which, by the way, if you do it before May sixteenth, you could be entered into that. You could win seven thousand dollars on a Mastercard. You could win a prize for rent. Them paying your rent and mortgage. You'll see the, all the details on their website. Um, you could choose your shaitel. This alone, if they just had the prize of winning a shaitel, if you're a, a man and you are married um, to a from woman, 
if they could choose whatever shaitel they want, you will be the best husband. And if you're a woman, you know how much you want a shaitel. So they that's a great prize. Um, grocery giveaway, $100,000 bonus, uh, Toyota uh, Sienna, uh, Tesla lease, home makeover. I literally listed some of the prizes. I have brachas from Sadiqim. Some of the prizes. I, I urge you to go on to uraauction.org and to buy a bunch of tickets it will give me the greatest nachas. How do you give a parent nachas? You, their child does good things and they follow Hashem and they do Torah. That's amazing. How do you give a podcast host nachas? You do all the things I said before, but also you go ahead and you buy the tickets to the auctions or go ahead and check out their other ads um, and, and buy tickets or listen to podcasts and do stuff like that. So go ahead and help support Ura and, and hopefully you'll win prizes too. Now back to this week's episode. Is was there ever a time or a moment that you were put in an uncomfortable position of maybe it's from one of your bosses or just the environment that you're in that they were kind of asking or you were being asked? I'm not saying anyone was doing anything wrong, but you were basically being asked to give up some form of your Yiddish kite, maybe a certain halacha or or something that's you know not something that a Orthodox Jew would do. Yeah, no, well, every day. <laughs> if it doesn't happen, really? I'm worried. I, I, yeah, if, if, it's, you know, if, if I have a three, four relaxed days, it means maybe uh, there's a problem where with me, I'm not focused for sure. I have so many examples. Let's take Shabbat as an example. So at first it was hard, you know, just to keep Shabbat. I, now people understand I will not be, you know, inside the studio, but hey, let's take you in New York, for example. Uh, let's say I have a show Mozart Shabbat and they want me to interview someone from New York. And I said, no. They said, listen, now you're really crazy. I said, oh, it's their Shabbat. You still keep Shabbat. Okay, but they tell me they're not from, they want to talk to you from New York. I said, no, I'm sorry, it's, I can't, I can't make them, you know, in the middle of being um, on TV on Shabbat. I don't think it's extreme, but yeah, some, sometimes people think, oh, wow, well, you forced them to, no, I just don't want to do it. It's, I think their Shabbat is holy, let's, let's be in touch uh, uh, on Sunday. One example, it happened uh, a few months ago, but I can give you uh, uh, another, many examples. Sometimes you have to cover, I'll give you a, a very, I would say, uh, uh, juicy an example. One of the Israeli celebrities just got engaged with someone who's not Jewish, uh, almost a very also very famous celebrity from from the states. And they told me to, to bless the new couple just to announce, you know, now we're engaged. And Mazel Tov. It's like a, at the end of the show we have this Mazel Tov uh, a minute. I'm sorry. How, how can I say Mazel Tov? You know, I'm I will not. You know, I, I don't wanna. I will not say anything against them. It's none of my business. I can definitely speak about that. Phenomenon that assimilation as a I will never say something private about someone's you know life. It's uh, it's not polite, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm sorry when I when I I'm, I cannot say Mazal Tov to this new couple. So people tell me you're a racist. It was published. It was all over here in Israel. I'm a racist, Jacob. You're now interviewing a racist journalist because this is my perspective toward the assimilation. And people told me what do you it's their love, just like people tell me it's their Shabbat in New York. Now it's their store. It's their I I don't tell them. I just don't, don't want to be. You know, part of it. I just just, just don't wanna, don't want to be involved in, and bless them as a new. I can't say Mazalto when it comes to assimilation. So sometimes, yeah, people see, think I'm, you know, way too extreme or way. Too, what can I do? Sometimes you have to fight your for your own. You know, the 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 um, to have like I would say self esteem or or yeah, uh, when it comes to uh, I don't want to say self devotion. It's not with nefesh, but it means yeah, being proud um, and know your values. Um, but usually people appreciate it when you say what you think and when you, and today, as I said, social media, that's the real place and I'm the real editor there, you know, so I do whatever I want there. So, uh, but yeah, there are many, many examples, but you know, I, I'm sure you and, and the listeners, they have their own examples. You know, it's, uh, the world is, is complicated. The world is complicated. So towards the end of the interviews, I always ask people, um, similar sort of questions. And I think I know the answer to this one because you said it twice already, but but maybe it's different. I don't know. What is your favorite mitzvah out of the 613? Wow. Um, maybe the first mitzvah, Shabbat. Um, I believe Shabbat is a revolution. It's it's a startup, a Jewish startup. And it's the base. I mean, if, if you keep Shabbat, you'll keep, I mean, you'll be connected to all the mitzvahs at the end of the day because it means everything. And maybe because that was the first thing, you know, uh, people showed me. Maybe uh, I was exposed and I and I fell in love. So for sure, Shabbat, because maybe it's a long way. So, you know, 25, 4, 25 hours. 
it's everything. It's a taste. You taste heaven, you know. Man or on about. It's, you taste the, the world to come every week. Wow, that's, I think, so. yeah, Shabbat for sure. That's really nice. So out of anyone in history or maybe someone from not too long ago that's no longer with us, if you could sit down with them for an hour, who would it be and what would you discuss? Wow. Uh, I want to say to the Baba Jerebbe, but I'm afraid uh, what he's going to say. So <laughs> now it's for sure that Lubavitch Rebbe. Uh, I'm not, you know, why Chabad. the Lubavitch Rebbe? I, right, I'm not, yeah, through, so why uh, him? Yeah, I'm not uh, officially part of Chabad, but in a way, I think this uh, is part of Shlichut, it's part of, of our life everywhere. I mean, where, wherever you are, you have to be a, a little bit of a Shaliyah, you know, have a, have, have a mission, have a being uh, caring about your fellow uh, 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 brothers and sisters. And I have so many questions about, I, I see him as a, you know, very influential leader, a spiritual. But also very, as I said, tachlis, very practical, and um, and someone who created so many, you know, unique projects. But at the end of the day, he had time, energy, and and he remembered each individual, each person, and uh, he inspired like millions, including myself. And sometimes when I have questions about what is, you know, today you don't have to choose uh, right from wrong. Sometimes you have to choose right from right. You know, in Hebrew we say yivuchal ben tov letov. There's a song that says. You have to leave hard to choose ben tov le tov between two good things. But at the end of the day, we do. We have most of us. We should choose. You know, the, the, choose about, you know, decide about the priorities. And I have so many questions sometimes about my priorities. You know, in time management and things, new projects, new dreams, and you know, so yeah. Baruch Hashem, uh, uh, and for sure, you know, grandmothers and grandfathers. Uh, I I miss them all. That would also be great. Uh, you know, talking to them. Is there a piece of advice that sticks out to you that was like the best advice you've ever received? Or you could do the reverse. What was the worst advice you've ever received? Or both. <laughs> wow. Uh, great questions. Let's see about the answers. Uh, uh, <laughs> the be- uh, the, uh, for sure, the best advice was to marry Yedidia, my husband. I was 21. I come from a completely secular background. It's like, ah. Uh, why, why should I get married at the age of 21? And why am I, why am I dating such a froom guy? What's going on here? And Bo Hashem, the many friends, with them, the minute they saw it, saw us, they said, that's the perfect shidduch. Despite the fact, you know, we're so, the background is different. Bo Hashem, they were uh, quite similar, but yeah, people su- listen to your friends. Listen, and if they tell you, don't marry this guy, listen to them, okay? Really. We need, uh, I think, p- uh, smart people and, and friends. They care about us. Listen to your parents. Always, today, we don't want to listen. You know, we don't want criticism. We, we know everything. We get, no, uh, we're not just individuals. We're part of a society and family. So definitely, I mean, uh, people who don't need a bunch of seats like that, the, the matches. And the worst advice was maybe, uh, oh, don't go into Torah. I, I started working, you know, as, as a journalist, also having a weekly she or and a daily WhatsApp. Oh, that's the right time to mention. Pl- pl- plug it. Plug your WhatsApp. Where could people not, go to join it? Google the daily WhatsApp or Google Sivan Rav Meir's daily WhatsApp. You can get uh, from today an English. T- choose the English. We have 70 languages. Choose the English or the Hebrew if you want to learn Hebrew. You can choose a language and get the content immediately for free on WhatsApp. Also email or text messages, whatever you want. It's the daily message I sent you from Israel. It's like a short piece of, I would say, inspiring, something uplifting from you, shall I? So yeah, people told you, oh, are you becoming a Rebetzin? Oh, you, you, you can't be a drillist if you're a Rebetzin. You don't have to be a Rebetzin in order to, to, to learn and teach Torah. So yeah, that was definitely the worst advice I got. Bo Hashem, I didn't listen. And uh, <laughs> the daily what, remember. That's really nice. Okay, I got like one or two more questions and then like an interesting question for you, I think. So something that we, we recently started doing is um, having this new segment, Le'ilu uh, Rinesh named Simcha Belsky, who, who passed away, you know, way too soon, but he was someone that went ahead and did chesed for other people. He just went out of his way. Is there a time in your mind that recently that either someone went out of their way to help you or that you could think of that you went out of your way to help someone else? We're trying to like promote this idea of Simcha time and just doing chesed because it's the right thing, even if it's not easy. Wow. Beautiful. First of all, beautiful. Yeah. We spent a year in the States, a year of Shlichut, the Jewish agency, our world was Rahim movement. They sent us to the States as Shlichim. We lived in the States for a year in New York and uh, for lectures. Now we come a lot, Hashem, all the time. 
But uh, then we, we really, five kids learn, learning, going to school in, in, in New York, and we were working there, and uh, health insurance. We're in New York. We're in New York. We're in New York. North, North Woodmere, part of uh, Five Towns. North Wo- Woodmere. I live in North Woodmere. Well, seriously? I just, I just moved there like a month ago. Wait, well, what year was this? Uh, uh, three years ago, until COVID started. Uh, wow. Is, yeah, yeah, I felt old. I see all the young couples, all the young people come. Uh, come to, to North Woodmere, just like you. I think we were seriously one of the older couples. There are so many new families and shuls and Rabbi Arya Leibovitz and everything. Rabbi every- Leibovitz, he's the best. He's yeah. the best. He's so great. Many, really, so many communities. Like, we felt like things are happening there, but we were hardly there on Shabbat because we spent, you know, I think dozens of communities from Montreal or Toronto or Memphis or Dallas or Chicago, Boston. We were Boch Hashem. Everywhere we were really invited, and we saw so many communities. And when it, when we had to leave in two days, COVID started. You know, the pandemic changed the world. We had to really escape. It was like dangerous to stay. No work, no uh, um, like schools or no uh, lectures. And what are we doing here? And uh, we we took the last flight to Israel. And then I saw what real chesed is. I, w- I really want to thank the neighbors, the Kastners, Ilana and Ronnie Kastner, that. They were, they took care of basically everything. We left everything behind, the books, the, 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 the um, you know, the clothes, everything. And they were like, uh, you know, they went into the house, took everything. They were keeping it for three years in their alley or basement. And so it was just, you know, I, I, you are never needed. Well, Hashem, I'm not, I never do, I need your help. And I needed some help uh, back then. I was like, it was impossible to, to take care of it by myself. And I can never really, I can never thank them enough. Other families, but you know, being there for someone uh, in need—it's not—it's not nice. You 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 love to feel strong. You like to be in the place where you give, but sometimes you have to let let people help you, and then be more passive. And and yeah, bochasya. Okay, offline we're we're gonna have. I'll send you like pictures of like the park or I, maybe the street you're on because it's so funny to me that you you literally lived in the place where I live now, and right. I have no clue. Um, I'm gonna, right before I ask my last question, I'm gonna ask you: Is there a story that either happened to you or that you heard that really gives you chizik, really inspires you? Uh, many stories. I just heard. Uh, Every day, I collect those stories every day. I mean, uh, that's what I do. So give us, give us the best of the best. What's your wow. favorite or of your favorites? Because wow. it's hard to it's answer. It's like asking I'm, you your favorite child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm good when it comes to, um, it, I'm, I'm great when it comes to asking the questions you're asking. I'm awful when it comes to, you know, answering them. No, I you're only, doing a great job. You're doing no, a great I job. And, and you know what it's like to get a good answer. So you, I, I'm enjoying this interview so much. You're giving <laughs> great <laughs> answers because you know what you, you want to hear from the other. Uh, you're doing a good job. Well, so you know what? Yeah, maybe we'll add with that. Uh, we mentioned Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. So he said that, uh, you know, he, he asked people, what do you think people ask me the most? What do you think is, is the question I hear? Uh, is the most popular question I get. And then people say, okay, people ask you about uh, halacha. People ask you about Jewish history, about moral situations, about uh, uh, Judaism versus Christianity or the Muslim world, or about Israel, PTS, you know, uh, advocacy. And then he said, you know, no, it's, it's great questions. Yeah, people ask me a lot about uh, all of these issues. But the question people ask me the most is, Rabbi Sachs, do you remember me? And I think it means a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, people want to be remembered. People want to be seen. Okay. It's crazy. I mean, he's the biggest philosopher, rabbi, chief rabbi, uh, you know, Lord, professor. At the end of the day, the question is, do you remember me? You met me in London. You saw me in Yerushalayim. You met me in New York. I heard your... It was like, people want to be in touch. And in a way, it means we can discuss ideologies, agendas. I have my own... You have your... I mean, it's okay. At the end of the day, we want, uh, I would, I think, personal connection. And it's not, I shared this story and Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs' brother, Ellen, he lives here in Yerushalayim. He reached out to me saying, it's not just about Rabbi Sachs, it's about my brother. It's also when it comes to Hashem. At the end of the day, our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch with Hashem, it's not just about our beliefs and the philosophies. It's about, do you remember me? Hashem remembers us, he loves us. And I think that's the most important thing. That is so nice. That is such a really, really nice answer. I'm like tearing up a little. Um, okay, so 
I've done probably like over 200 interviews, um, which for you is probably like you did that by the age of eight. But <laughs> for me, that's a lot. And I don't think I've ever, and I could be wrong. I, I apologize to anyone if I'm forgetting. I don't think I've ever interviewed a journalist. And every question I always ask is always like, okay, what does the audience want to hear? What do they want to learn? But I'm going to selfishly finish off with this last question for myself because I, I don't know if I've ever interviewed a journalist. Definitely, you're, you're of the world's best journalist to me for sure. And I want to ask you for advice. What advice would you give to me, uh, someone who's who's doing something similar and to some extent of what you're doing, obviously very different, but I'm talking to people. I'm trying to get good stories. I'm trying to inspire people. What advice would you have for me, for Yaakov Langer? So maybe, Yaakov, you know, behind the scenes, I'll tell the, I think my advice is something you already do. You're already doing for, uh, in a very successful way. Uh, being, uh, being a nudnik, meaning we think, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> reaching out to people, asking them to come. I think you, you, you started texting me, I think a year ago, something no, like that. I was, so, and it's a, whatever, this doesn't come up much, but <laughs> I, I was, I, I started podcasting right when you left America. I started a podcast, Meaningful People. I did this for two years and it was great. Starting then, I was already reaching out to you. Wow, wow, and wow. then, and then whatever, whatever, it's fine. And they go, they went in their direction. I went in my direction. And I'm like, okay, I got to really, I'm like, you're amazing. I want to have you. And if there's someone that I want, I'm very good and very focused on like, I, I want to have you. And again, I'm not like, Mir Baruch Hashem, you're going to have more than like 100 views on this. So I'm confident that it's worth your time and hopefully your WhatsApp's going to grow. But go back to what you're saying. Being a nudnik, no, no, okay, no, good. No, what I want to say is be focused and if you have your goal, okay, be a nudnik. And you really reach out to me. I'm embarrassed to see, you know, because I think hundreds of times maybe, you know, on my WhatsApp, uh, in our chat, you ask me, okay, now you're in New York. Let's do it. Oh, you're in New York again. No, you're in Israel. Where are you? What's going on? You started texting me in Hebrew. I said, maybe it's in Israel. I don't know. <laughs> You no, know, you, you tried Chinese, you tried everything in order to... <laughs> As Google yeah. Translate, Google Translate, yeah. we could do anything. So, Baruch Hashem, and, and thank you for that, because I'm happy I, I came. And yeah, I'm not familiar with the American podcast world, and sometimes many people reach out to me. It takes time to understand it's a successful podcast, serious one, and I should definitely be here. So, thank you for that. So, I think this tip for each individual, you know, in their field, in their niche, uh... You know, do and reach out once. If you just text someone and they don't answer, they don't re do not respond. It means nothing, really. Call them again. Make sure you know who you are, and at the end of the day, you'll have an interview with them. And it's just an example. Take it into into your life, and, and thank you for that. And I'm really sorry. Maybe I'll do it now, not before Yom Kippur. I'm really sorry. I <laughs> I wasn't really available, and I'm really gl glad I'm here at the end of the day. Well, it's it's there's nothing to apologize. You're a busy person, and and I it's un I understand why so many people want to interview you. You're doing so many amazing things for the world, and I really appreciate you coming on and personally giving me chizuk with this conversation. I really appreciate it. And uh, Laila Tov, thank you very much, Laila Tov, Bokir Tov, and Shalom from Yerushalayim to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. Uh, go ahead and uh, join join our WhatsApp group. It, it, it's you're here for inspiration. You get that, and I really enjoy this conversation. You know, I, I get to speak to so many people that don't ever conduct interviews, I guess, and to talk to someone, I feel like a peer. So if I could say so myself, I mean, she's on a way bigger level than me. But like, it's really cool to to sit and 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 talk um, to someone like that. So, if you got up to this point in the video on YouTube, if you're listening to this, you can just rate us five stars. That's good enough. But are you on YouTube and you want to rate us um, five? I mean, you can't rate us five stars on YouTube, but you can leave a comment. I don't know why, but when you leave comments on YouTube, it helps the video. And we want everyone, all of Israel, all of America, we want everyone to see this. So, please leave the comment, the word Toda. That in Hebrew means thank you. So leave the word toda. If you want to add on something to this, if maybe there's a point in it that you're like, oh, Sivan, I really like what she said. I, I, I have to bring her back on. I, I need to ask her about her name, Sivan. It's so interesting. Um, like the month, I guess? I'm not even sure. But until next time, we will hear that. Go ahead and check out the Good Faith Effort Podcast. Go ahead to simchatime.org to uh, tell Simcha Time the Simcha Time that you did so they know that something's happening um because we all the time do simchas and chesed and and they want to know about it so go ahead and let them know and don't forget to buy tickets to the uru auction I, I feel it i feel it in my bones someone who watched this episode is going to be a winner so 
I mean, there's so many prizes. It's, it's factually, someone's gonna win, right? So I want it to be an inspirational listener. If you didn't yet subscribe to this podcast, subscribe. I'm out. Keep on being inspirational. Have a good Shabbos. Well, you just listened to this much of Shabbos. So the next Shabbos you have, have a good Shabbos. I'm out. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.